Father, we want to come and say thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your healing power. There are some of us here today that we need a deep touch from you. We need you to put the pieces back together again. But we know, Lord, that when we do speak the name of Jesus over circumstances, situations, they change. And we want to do that right now over our high schools and our community, Father, and ask for our kids' lives, Lord, that um, you would bring healing to families right now and protection to children that are confused, broken, discouraged, despairing, that you are the answer, Father, that we all need. And we pray, Holy Spirit, you would come and bring healing to our community, bring healing to our lives. Touch us and heal us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Okay, we're gonna be in two different places today. If you've got a Bible, an iPad, a phone, you wanna go there, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 19, and we're gonna be in Malachi, the last chapter in the Old Testament. So if you're in the book of Matthew and you just went over one chapter to the left, you'll crash into the last book in the Old Testament, and that's Malachi. We're gonna be in those two places. We're picking up the third part of a five-part series on marriage. And uh, there's things that we do about marriage. Sometimes talk about marriage relationships and, and those kinds of things are, are really fun and they're, and they're funny. Uh, but then sometimes there's teachings of Jesus that are not fun or funny. They're really what? Hard, they're hard teachings. How many know Jesus did some hard teachings? I mean, the, hard te the hard teachings are like, oh, let's just skip that, you know? How many know you're not supposed to skip the hard teachings? You're supposed to like dive into the hard teachings and let them dive into you. And so we're gonna do that today because we're gonna go into some of the hard teachings and things where you're like, wow, what are you saying, Lord? What do you do? Let's talk about this today. Let's talk about failure. Now, I know you all want to talk about success because we all love success, but the truth is in our relationships, we all do what sometimes? Fail. We all fail sometimes. I mean, you have failed people, I fail people, we all fail people, and we fail in our relationships. I, I have families come in sometimes with um, talking about their, just their family dynamics. We're going to have a family reunion, we're going to have a family get together, and I don't want to go. Why don't you want to go? Because I haven't talked to my sister for six years. You haven't talked to your sister for six years. No, we got mad at each other and we just don't talk anymore. And that, that's just not unusual to hear people say things like that, friends, unfortunately. That we have, when we have close relationships and we wound each other, how many know we just flee? Hello? We just like leave the room and we're like, I, I, you know what, I just will move on to the next thing because it's too painful to not. But, but Jesus is a healer. And he, he said that he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to try to put things back together, not just run away from, from pain and difficulty. But the most difficult pain that I ever deal with with people, typically, is divorce. I mean, divorce is just so destructive and tearing and painful and it is the, the rejection that comes out of it, the hurt that comes out of it. The, I mean, really, in this room right now, half of you, statistically, half of you have been impacted by divorce, either as a child or as a married person who's gone through a divorce. So divorce impacts all of us, and the Bible has things to say about divorce. They're very important things to say. Let me give you some thoughts here. In the 1930s, one out of seven marriages in America ended in divorce. In the 1960s, one out of four marriages in America ended in divorce. By 1970, between 1970 and 1990, divorce rate doubled in America. So today, some of the latest statistics put it this way. Most of you hear 50% of the people who get married, divorced, and how many of you know nobody goes to the altar like, okay, this is gonna be a great honeymoon and then we're gonna divorce. Nobody ever gets married thinking they're gonna what? Divorce, nobody does. But, but when you're sitting there going, well, I have a prenup, pastor, no, that, you're, you're the nobody over there. Okay, so I'm joking, but hardly anybody thinks like that. But here are the statistics for today. 43% of first marriages end in divorce today, 43%. Now, how do you get to the 50% number? I'll show you. 67% of second marriages end in divorce. 73% of third marriages end in divorce, and over 90% of fourth marriages end in divorce. So you have all these other marriages, second, third, and fourth times around, that compound the 43% number and get you over 50%. That's why people say 50% of the people who get married do what? They divorce. But it's always, friends, it's always painful. You might say, well, it must not be as painful for the people uh, later because they do it more often. <laughs> the truth is they carry more baggage and they can't get rid of it. That's what we want to talk about today. Because when you go through divorce, you need healing. 
Healing is so important. You can't just fly through relationships. If you go, friends, just think about this. If you lose a friend, it's a wound. I mean, and the closer a friend is that you lose, the deeper the wound is. If you lose a spouse, it's even deeper, and much deeper. So when, when you talk about these kind of things, you think like this. Here's some other thoughts for you, just statistically. Um, people who live together and shack up, your chance of divorce is somewhere between 35 and 50% or, or splitting up permanently is 35 to 50% greater than a person who gets married. And, and we covered some of these on Friday night with our men's conference, but couples whose friends end in divorce, their close friends end in divorce, have a 75% increased chance of divorce in the next five years. There's like a social thing here. It's like, it's like it impacts you, gives you permission. Something happens that's not healthy. 75% of those who divorce cited a lack of commitment more as, as a reason of, of divorce, more than infidelity, which was 60%, finances, which is 38%, or domestic abuse, uh, uh, abuse which was 24%. Then I need to pause on that for just a minute and say, I, I always joke with you and tell you people write me emails, but I got an email this week that was really important, and I need to pause on that email and apologize. Because last week when we were talking about marriage, we were talking about sometimes how frustrated you get, and I said something like, sometimes you just want to, you know, like that. And this person wrote me an email and said, please don't ever do that, because that's what my husband used to do to me. And it was very painful when you said that. I know you didn't mean to do that. And certainly I was never intending to give permission. I was playing. But, but want to ask your forgiveness. If you are a victim of domestic abuse, certainly never want to make light of that ever, 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 ever. And sometimes women say, well, we're, we're the one. You know, I have men come in my office today and tell me that their wives hit them. Oh, I do. You know why? Because I said it last week to you. People are angry today. We're like so wound up and we're so angry. And, and, and I said this to you last week if you weren't here, but we have great classes on anger management for women and to get anger healed in men and women because we are angry people. So let's keep going and talk about this. When you, when you start to look at this, you talk about 67% of men, 74% of women think their partner should have worked harder to save the marriage. We, we all look at each other like, if you would have tried harder, it would have been better. If you would have tried harder, it would have been better. The truth is, most of us don't try as hard as we probably should when it gets really hard. If you are a person shacking up and cohabitating, women are 76% more likely to be depressed and struggle in a cohabiting relationship than married women. 72% of couples said they, now this is a huge one, 72% of couples said they didn't fully understand what they were committing to when they got married. <laughs> I think that number is 100%. Because <laughs> I, I, I like had no idea what I was committing to when I got married. I was like, la, oh, la, 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 this is going to be awesome. That lasted like five minutes, right? You know, it's like, wow, this is hard. This is way harder. I didn't, 72% of the people said they had no idea what they were committing to when they got married. Now, when people divorce, 70% of divorces are started by women. They're the ones who file. And when you ask women, when they ask women in this survey that I was studying this week, why did you file? The answer is because he's unfaithful to me, he's not committed to the relationship, he's gone already. And, and we talked about this as men on Friday night because the truth is men leave relationships quickly, we disconnect our heart, we don't know how to manage our brokenness. When things get hard for us, we just flee. We talked about some of this last week, but the truth is God doesn't want you to just walk away, is that right, from any relationship. I mean, if you're friends with somebody, he doesn't want you just to get mad at each other and just walk away. He doesn't want you, when you have a breakdown at work with somebody, just to put up the big wall and walk away. It's always about reconciliation. It's about, can we heal the hurt? Can we build bridges instead of blow them up? We all can throw a, 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 a hand grenade in the room and walk away. That's easy. I mean, it's easy just to blow people up. How many of you know it's hard to put them back together? But Jesus is in the business of putting them back together. He wants you as a Jesus follower if you are, and this is for you today. If you're not, we're just, you know, listen and enjoy. But if you're a Jesus follower, friends, we're supposed to be reconcilers. We're supposed to be healers. We're supposed to help put people back together. So finally, finally, only 10% of all divorcees, both male and female, men and women on each side, 
Did they both say they were happier? Only 10% of both people said they were happier after they went through a divorce. 90% of the people said they wish they would have been able to make it work and survived it, 90%. And all the statistics say that, friends. They always say this, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, it's gonna be a battle. You can get over the hill. As soon as you start to hit the 40s, the, the happiness quotient just starts to go up because you worked through the issues and you started to build relationship through the battle. How many of you know when you go through struggles with people, it gets better? If you can stay in a relationship, whether it's a sports team that you're on and you, and you battle together, you get closer. It's the same with it, whether you're in the military and you go through a battle together, you get closer. Anywhere in life you go through struggles with people, you get what? Closer. You can grow closer together or it can fracture you apart. In marriage, it's no different. If you can stay in through the battle, all, all of the stats, they all say that by the time you get to 45 and 50, you're way happier because you're closer. You battled out the, the issues together. So finally, I know you thought we'd never get here, but we're already to point number one. So, I mean, just talking about marriage, it's important to put some context to this because marriage is a big deal to God. And marriage, by the way, is God's idea, not societies or cultures. The Bible starts with a marriage in Genesis 1 and 2. We're gonna read that in just a minute out of, out of uh, Matthew 19. When Jesus was questioned about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, he went right to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. And he quotes from Genesis 1 and 2, a man will leave his mother and father and he will cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That was what Jesus said. He said, this is how it's been from the beginning. Now here's the problem with that. Some of you don't believe the book of Genesis, but Jesus did. Okay, that's important to say to you. The Bible starts with a marriage. You get to the middle of the Bible. Jesus' first miracle was, a, was at a wedding. And then you go into the book of Genesis, or Genesis, Ephesians chapter five, and he goes back to Genesis talking about the mystery of marriage and that God actually calls his church what? The bride of Christ. That the church is the bride of Christ. And, and it says that he likens, Paul likens your marriage on earth to God's marriage with you in heaven. And then you go into Revelation chapter 19. In fact, if you've got a Bible, an iPad, a phone, turn over to Revelation 19 really quick with me. Because in verse seven, a lot of you've never got here. And um, I know you try to read your Bible, but you don't make it all the way to Revelation. So I'll help you with that. No, Revelation 19, verse seven. Gives you a picture so you can understand the magnitude of marriage to, to, to God, to your Father. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write these things down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Uh, blessed are those who are, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be at this. Hello? <laughs> blessed are those who are, who, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a picture of God uniting himself with his people in the most intimate of all relationships. So marriage is really important to what? To God. It is. It's just a, it's a foundational aspect. So let's pick up in the Old Testament in Malachi. If you've got your Bible, your iPad, your phone. If you're at Upland, we want to welcome you guys over at Upland or Townsville or online. Well, I want to read to you from Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. It says, here's another thing that you do. This is like the prophet Malachi speaking for God about Israel and how they have fallen away from him. He said, here's another thing that you do. You cover the Lord's altar with your tears, with weeping, with groaning, because he pays no attention to your offerings, and he doesn't accept them with pleasure. Now, I want you to read with me, if you would, up on the screen behind me. Let's read this loud and together. It says, you cry out, why has the Lord abandoned us? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made to each other on your wedding day when you were young. But you have been disloyal to her, though she remains your faithful companion, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard yourself 
remain loyal to the wife of your youth for what? I hate divorce, says the Lord God. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. It is as cruel as putting on a victim's blood-stained coat, says the Lord God Almighty. So guard yourself and remain loyal to your wife. That's a crazy statement, but that's the heart of God. And when you look at this, and some of you are like, wow, that really pushes my buttons. I, I told you there's things that the Bible says that are easy, and there's things that are what? This is hard, this is like hard. But friends, you grow when you deal with the hard stuff and you start to battle through it and you start to figure out, okay, what's God up to here? God is never trying to hurt you. He's always trying to help you. So the Bible's really clear. He wants you to get into places where you can grow and you can flourish. And so God isn't trying to get you in a place where you feel defeated and bad, but he wants you to grow and flourish. So you look at this picture and you go, okay, so what happened here? He said, the Lord saw that you made vows to your wife and you did it in front of God. That's called a covenant, by the way, not a contract, but a covenant. You make a contract with another person and what your contract does is protects your rights and defends your position. But that isn't what you do in the Bible. You don't make a contract with a person in the Bible, you make a covenant. In a covenant, you lay down your rights and your own desires, and you take up the other person's need, and you guard and protect the other person. That's a biblical picture of a marriage covenant, that you take up the other person and you care for them. So he said, you were not faithful, though she was faithful to you. What does God want from you? He makes this wild statement. He wants godly children from you. And you're like, oh no, what is that about? Well, I'll tell you what that's about. Since you ask, no, this is important. In this survey I was studying this week, they said across America, now that may not be the case in our church, because we're a very diverse church here, but across America, 80% of the people who go to church regularly come out of homes with two parents in them. Holy, did you hear what I just said? 80% percent of the people that regularly go to church in America come out of homes with two parents in them. Now, you might go, what is that about? Well, it has to do with this. Something happens when it's done right, when marriage is done right, it creates faith. And it creates what, like Jesus talked about the parable of the sower. He said, you sow some of the seed on the rocky soil, some on the hard soil, some of it springs up, burns off. But he said, then there's the good soil Well, clearly, a marriage that's done well and right creates good soil for faith to grow. That's the picture. And that's really what God is saying is, listen, when you do this, your kids are getting, they'll flourish underneath it if you can do it God's way. How many know that's really hard? Hello, come on, somebody back there in the back say yes. Because y'all back there, all the people in the front row are saying yes, but I'm looking at y'all way up there. No, it's hard, it's hard. Marriage is hard, man. It's, a, it's hard to stay in when it, gets, when it, when it hurts you. And it, it's hard to stay in all relationships. And we aren't a people that typically battle through. We often just surrender and think this, I'll just close that off and move on. You know what the problem with that is? You took your baggage with you. Hello? I know you don't think you have any, but okay, we'll keep going here because we all do. Now, Jesus put it this way. Jesus said marriage was by its own nature it was intended to be permanent. And he said, but Moses gave or allowed you to have divorces. And I'm gonna read this to you in a minute. And Jesus said, but only for one reason, because the hardness of your heart, the hardness of your heart, the hardness of your heart, that's, wow, really? So anytime you go through divorce, you gotta think like this, my heart must be hard. Now that doesn't mean you're bad. I'm not saying you're bad. Hardness of heart comes from, to all of us whenever we get under duress. We tend to close up and shield up and defend ourselves. And as soon as you start to close up and shield up and defend yourself, your heart starts to get colder. The more you open up your heart, the warmer it gets. The more you close it up, what? The colder it gets. So Jesus used this word skelicardia. He said, because of the skelicardia, uh, uh, inside of you. Literally, skele, we get skeleton from. Cardia, we get heart from. You have this hard heart. You have this thing that happens that isn't supposed to happen to your heart. Your heart's supposed to stay soft, but whenever you get hurt, how many of you know it gets what? 
And you got to get back before your father and say, God, help me. I need healing. It was what we sang today. When, when, whenever I speak the name of Jesus over you, that you would get healing, that you would get life. Because when Jesus comes and he begins to speak into my wounded, broken heart, then it starts to soften back up again. But friends, if I am in charge of my heart, I want to keep it hard because it doesn't hurt as much. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It doesn't hurt as much when it's hard. It's like, you know, I'm okay. You're okay? I'm okay. You know? But I'm not okay because I'm losing my destiny. I'm losing my possibility. I'm losing my ability to connect with other people when my heart gets hard. And so God is trying to really say, let me help you. So let me walk through some painful thoughts here for you because the Bible talks about three reasons that people end up separated or divorced. The first one is obvious, when a person dies. That's not a divorce, but it's a, a cessation of the relationship. When a person dies a physical death, Genesis 3.19 says that it, it absolves the marriage. It says that in Deuteronomy 25.5 and Matthew 22.33. Jesus said that. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, 9, teaching that widows ought to remain as he was, which was single. But if he need to let them be married, let them be married. In 1 Corinthians 7, 39 and 40, a widow is said to be free to marry whomever she wishes in the Lord, which means as an, with another believer. And then Paul writing to young Timothy when he was in Ephesus, we studied this the last couple of months, he also supported this when he said, therefore I would like younger widows to get married. So if somebody dies, the person is released and free to get remarried. The second thing that can end a relationship is adultery. Jesus taught that in chapter 5, verse 31 of Matthew, and chapter Chapter 19. Adultery doesn't have to end the marriage, but oftentimes it does. Now, I know this, that some of you sitting in the room are going through this right now. I know that. Because I deal with this all the time. You live in a culture today where all you see on television is hop into bed with this person, have a fling, go home, it'll be okay. It's never okay. If only you could see what happens in my office after an affair. It would just put the fear of God right through you where you would never do it. It is not worth it. And whenever we go somewhere else, and I understand going somewhere else because you're like this, I feel rejected at home or fighting at home. You know, she used to think I was like the, 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 the smartest guy in the world, the most handsome person. Now she treats me like, you know, and, and so this other lady at work really thinks I'm cute and so I'm gonna get, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do our thing and go to bed together and yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm gonna stay home because I love my kids and no, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. You just completely miss the whole thing. Let me explain this to you really quick. Intercourse is like the seal around marriage. That's clearly spelled out in the Bible. So, so you leave your mother and father, you cleave to your husband and your wife, you become one flesh. It's a direct reference to intercourse. So it literally says this. When you get married and you have sex, you put a seal around that relationship. You don't do that with anybody else. You don't do it with your friends, your grandparents, your kids. You don't do it with anybody. It's a seal around the relationship. If you break the seal, you've broken it in the spiritual realm. Can it be repaired? Yes. Is it painful? Way yes. Does it take time? Yes. But it can happen. It can happen. Now, is there a danger? I mean, this is so painful, friends. It's the most painful thing I deal with in my office on a regular basis for the last 40 years. You watch people go through it. How many pastors? I probably worked with ministry leaders close to 50 or 60 ministry leaders that have fallen sexually. Some of them have been restored. Their marriages are still intact. Others are completely washed out. Just depends on, on the circumstance, the situation, and the hearts of the people. Do you want to repent? Do you want to bow down before God and say, Father, I made this huge mistake. I need healing. How many of you know anytime you do that, God will begin to restore you? Hello? Begin to restore you. But don't ever think this. Don't ever think that you're, you know, your life is like a big pond with glass all over it. It's just totally shiny. And you're gonna about ready to take a big boulder and throw it in the middle of it. And the ripples are gonna go out far and wide when you have an affair. I mean far and wide. And they're gonna be really painful. Listen to Jesus' words. You got your Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 19. 
Matthew chapter 19, Jesus was in this interaction with some religious leaders called Pharisees, and there were two schools of thought, two like Bible schools or seminaries that they went to. One was more liberal than the other, one was Shammai, one was Halil, one was liberal, one was more conservative, and they had different opinions about when you could divorce your wife. Now, bless you girls, we love you, but you couldn't divorce your husband in, in, the, in biblical days. So men always could what? divorce their wives, but their wives couldn't divorce their husbands. So the discussion was completely one-sided here, unfortunately, but it was one-sided. So one group of people, the liberal guys, said this, you can divorce your wife if she burns your dinner. <laughs> no, really, that's what they said. If she burns a dinner, she's gone. <laughs> yeah, no, watch. When Jesus had finished speaking these words in verse one, chapter 19, he departed from Galilee, he came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Then in verse three, some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him and ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man should be, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now we quote those words often in weddings but Jesus is the one who said them. Then in verse seven, they ask him another question. Now this is a loaded question and you gotta get the nuances of the words to understand what's happening here. They said to him, why did Moses, who they saw as their father in the Old Testament, their leader, why did Moses command us to give her a writ or a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus answered back to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Not commanded you, but he what? He, he, he allowed it to happen. He permitted it to happen because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. I told you, hard teaching, huh? Hello? Somebody say yes, hard teaching, right? Sometimes Jesus gives you some seriously what? Hard teaching. Some of you are sitting there right now going, uh, 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 I'm married, we're married, we both got divorced, we're married. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about that in a second, but, but, but here's the reality. It's a hard teaching. Jesus always puts the bar up really high. That, that's what he did here. He put the bar up really high, and he said, look at from the beginning, this is, was God's intent. Now, you know what's so amazing about God? He knows you're human, yes. right. and he works with humans. That's what happened with Moses. So these guys said, why did Moses command us to give a writ of divorce? Like, why did he, why, why, why did he tell us, you gotta do this? And Jesus said, no, 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 never happened. He permitted you, he allowed you to do it because you're human. God made a concession because of your brokenness. Do, do you get that? Yes. Somebody over here say yes, please. I just wanna make sure you guys are alive over here, okay. He, he made a concession because he's God and he knows you're human. Uh, does that mean he would like you to get over the bar? Absolutely. Does that also mean he understands that you're not always gonna make it? Yes. That's exactly what happened with Moses. That's exactly what happened. Now here's what Jesus didn't do. He didn't do this. Just do whatever you wanna do, it's okay. He didn't do that. Because he knows it's not okay. He's trying to get you to walk in a way that will bring life to you and life to your kids. And if you do that, and life to the people around you, if you do that, you will flourish. But if you choose to go your own way, it's gonna get really, really hard. So what is he saying? He's saying, listen, whenever your relationships fracture, your heart's in danger. Your life is in danger and your destiny is in danger. The enemy will come intentionally to fracture your relationships just to ruin your destiny and your calling. Because how, how easy is it for him to sidetrack you 
from caring for other people and making a difference in this world whenever your relationships are fractured? Yes or no? That's what happens here, friends. So it shouldn't shock you that hell wants to destroy your relationships, especially your marriages. It shouldn't shock you. It's part of the journey. Now, does that mean God just, uh, uh, you know, he just leaves you to it? No, 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 no. There's a whole battle here. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we got three things happen here. Death ends the marriage. Adultery can break the marriage. And the last one is desertion. Now, desertion is really controversial, and I want to cover that with you really quick. You got your Bible, your iPad, your phone. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. See, I have people um, use this all the time with me. They'll come in my office and I'll say, okay, so you're going to file for divorce. And by the way, if you come in my office, you just better, just know I'm not going to ever agree with you divorcing. Hardly ever. Hardly ever. I will agree with you separating and trying to get healing. Now, you'll tell me your story is really bad, and I know it is. Sometimes it has domestic abuse and all kinds of bad things. I understand. But I always try to believe for people to get restored at the, at the beginning because that is the heart of God. So if you come in, I'm not going to usually say to you, okay, just file for divorce, it's okay. I'm probably not going to say that. Now, people will come in my office often. I had a lady in my office a year or two ago, and she she said this to me. She goes, Pastor, I'm going to divorce him because he deserted me. I go, really? Where did he go? She goes, oh, he didn't go anywhere. He still sleeps in the bed, but he's just disappeared. He works all the time. He's never here. That is not desertion, okay? That is not what this is talking about. So, so if, you, if you look at, uh, at, at 1 Corinthians 7.10, it says, but to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, if the, any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send him away. For the unbelieving husband can become sanctified or touched by God through his wife, and the unbelieving wife by her believing husband. For otherwise your children would become unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave, and the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, for God has called you to peace. So the, the real controversy is what does it mean they're not under bondage? Most people interpret that to mean that they don't have to stay in the marriage and honor it. I've had people come in my office and said, you know, my spouse got in the car one day, drove away, and I haven't seen her for seven years. Not a phone call, nothing. That's desertion. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's keep going because there's some other things here that are really important you want to talk, that, that, that we need to talk about before we close up. When you start to talk about divorce, why is it so tearing? Because it is so connecting. Marriage is really, it's the most intimate connecting that there can be. So I always liken it to Velcro. I don't know if you ever go to the river or you go wave running, you know, wakeboarding or, 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 or skiing or whatever, but if you do, or tubing, you put on a vest and you put this huge vest on with big, huge Velcro straps, and when you put them together, it goes and they grab onto each other. And when you pull them apart, it goes That's exactly what happens in marriage. You have all these super fine little tentacles and they connect to each other from two people's lives and then you tear them apart and you can just feel the ripping when you're, you're like tearing people's hearts apart from each other. That's why God said he hates divorce, not because he hates people that go through divorce. He hates what it does to you. It hates what it does to children. It hates what it does to humans. So what happens then? Well, oftentimes people go through divorce and they are shunned they're neglected, they're pushed off to the side, they feel alone. That's why we have divorce recovery at Water of Life. And we actually have a table out in the foyer today. And if you need to be there, then you should sign up and get there. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a minute. But the truth is this, here's the reality. Do we like divorce? No. Moses didn't like it either, but he understood it was human. Do, do you get this? God understands when we fail, and he tries to pick us up and heal us up. Romans 5.20 says, where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. The harder my heart gets, the more God pours out his mercy on me to try to soften it. The more he tries to get a hold of me. 
I, I always talk about this with Gail and I because we've been married 45 years, but only, and I said this last week, but only because she's so committed and dogmatic about it. You know, if it was my way, I would have walked away a few times. You know, she was like, I'm not leaving. You're not gonna get rid of me. <laughs> so, you know, it was that kind of a deal, you know, and, and because of that, we made it 45 years. Now, the reality is this. My situation, my problem in marriage is I grew up in a really fractured home. So my mother, and many of you know the story, my mother was a really brilliant person, a very smart lady, but she was in a large family, born in the mountains of Arkansas in a cabin. By the time she was 14 years old, her father wanted her and her sisters out of the house, so she got married. 14. Hello? She was married at 14 to an older man. She got married at 14. She, my brother was born when she was 15 and a half, just about 16. She was married to a man who was abuser, so he would beat her up. As my brother got older, he began to stand between his mother and this man and try to defend her. Then he started to beat my brother up. At that point, she took them both and they fled the home. Ended up divorcing him and then later met my father and I was born 25 years later when she was 40. So my brother was 25 years older than me. When I was born, I, I don't know if you've ever heard people say you drive me to drink, but I think I must have done that for my mom. Okay, because she became an alcoholic in her older years and my poor father, and I told some of this story on on Friday night at the men's conference, but my poor dad, my dad was a massively wonderful person, but completely overmatched by my mom. My mom was a voracious reader. She read everything she could get her hands on, taught herself fluent Spanish. Um, she, she was just a really smart person. My sister was a valedictorian. My brother has a PhD, he was a doctor, and here I am. <laughs> I got what was left over, okay. So, um, <laughs> you know, but, but the reality was, the reality was my poor dad, my poor dad was completely overmatched by my drunk mom. I mean, she, my mom was a rager. When she started drinking, she lost her mind. And I remember as a four-year-old laying on the floor one night asleep and waking up to my parents screaming over me because my mom would get drunk and she would throw us in the car, me and my sister, and she would speed around the block, flying all over the place, and you would be hitting yourself, your head on the window and flying across, there were no seatbelts, flying across the seat and, and she was drunk and speeding down the street and my dad wasn't gonna let her do that. So he had a hold of my arm and I woke up and she had a hold of my other arm and they were pulling me apart, screaming at each other. I don't, I, I mean, I don't know how many things you remember when you were four or five years old, but usually the only things you really remember are traumatic. That's why I remember that event. The next year, things got so bad in our home that my dad took me. I remember when I was in, going into first grade. I was going into first grade and I started, you remember your first day of school, anybody here? Like two of you, you're like, yeah, that was a long time ago in a land far away, right? Yeah, but your first day in school that you ever walked in the classroom, you know, not kindergarten, but when you got a desk and all that stuff, well, that first day, my mom was drunk. So my dad was like, I can't have him in the house. So he took me to Anaheim, to his sister's house in Anaheim, and they enrolled me in school there. I didn't know anybody in Anaheim. All my friends were in Pomona. And now I'm in Anaheim, and I go into class. The classes had already started. It's first day of school. I go into class. I'm sitting. There's no chair. So I'm sitting against a counter in the back, and I'm six years old, and I'm freaking out inside, like, what am I doing here? Why did my parents take me here? I had no clue what was happening. And they got me a chair. They set it down uh, back in the corner by the back door, and then they were trying to find a desk for me. There was no desk. And then you remember in first grade, they handed out, like, crayons and your paper. Remember, anybody remember this? Okay, the, I remember it, because when they got to me, they didn't have any. They had enough for everybody in the classroom because it had been counted out already before I walked in the door that morning, was enrolled, and they didn't have any for me. But see, I was so jacked up by then, I already knew I had been rejected by my parents. I was already embracing a spirit of rejection. I was six years old, and when they skipped me, 
I just looked at the door, and when the teacher turned her back, I ran for it. And I went down the street as fast as I could into Anaheim where I had no idea where I was going, and I walked the street for hours till the police picked me up. I was six years old. I had no idea what I was doing. They called my father, he came and got me, took me home, but the damage was done, friends. By the time I was 12, my mom gave her life to Christ, got into Alcoholics Anonymous, got dry, got healed, but I was a mess completely broken inside, completely embrace the spirit of rejection. So anytime that I get into a conflict with somebody that I really care about, what do you think the first thing I think is? I'm headed for the door, you're right. No, I do, I think that way. So do some of you, exactly the same. The only difference, the reason I'm still in is because I kept doing the work to let Jesus heal me. I kept going back and going back and going back and crying out to God like, I know I have this. I don't want to live in this. I don't want my life to be defined by destruction, but by Jesus. You don't need your life to be defined by divorce, friends. It needs to be defined by Jesus, not your failures. God is bigger than your failures. I mean, is the destruction of divorce real? Yeah, that's what do you think God said? He hates divorce because it's so destructive. Did you know that people who get divorced die 57% at a higher rate than people who are not? Because it's so traumatic to your person. And, and, and so when you start to look in this, you see how people's bonds and their hearts are broken. You end up in instability with friendships of your friends, your children, everybody. People come in my office and they'll say this to me. They'll go, Pastor, I'm better. You know, they want to get remarried and they'll say, would you remarry me? The first thing I say is, tell me the work you've done to get healed. Have you been through divorce recovery? Have you done any caring? Have you done any counseling? Have you done any repenting? Has God got in your business? And they'll say, you know, I'm okay. Then immediately I know they're not. I know this. They've just told themselves they're okay, but they're still angry. They're still rejected and they're still hurt. They need to be what? Healed, they need time. Friends, it takes time to get healed. But God is a healer, he'll put you back together if you'll let him, but if you don't let him, he can't do it. I mean, you got spiritual, emotional, physical, mental destruction happen everywhere. It takes time to put you back together. But God is in the business of restoration, reconciliation and healing. So when I look at my dad, as bad as my dad was, as overmatched as he was with my mom, the amazing thing about my dad, that never left me, and I used to make fun of the poor guy over this. Because, see, I, 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 I'm like my mom, loud and, you know, you know, I am. But my poor dad, I mean, I talked to a person that used to go to church here. He, they passed away, actually. But her husband was my father's partner at General Telephone. Rode in the truck with him for 20 years. And she said to me one day, you know what? Your dad was the nicest person God ever made. I mean, my dad was a super good guy. He was just a good guy, overmatched by my mom. Didn't know what to do with us in the crisis. He didn't know how to handle it. And I I, I had very little respect for my father growing up because of that. But you know, I look back today and I realize he saved my life. Because every day I would get up and I would head out the door and there he would be in his chair with his Bible open every single morning praying for me and and my sister and our family. If you ask my dad, were you happily married? I'm sure he would have said no. But because he contended so deeply for our lives, that's the only reason I'm here today. And I believe it's the only reason I got well is because I had a father who never quit. As much as I would go out the door and I would ridicule him with my friends and say he's reading his Bible again today, he understood things I had no idea about. Friends, some of you need to figure this out. You may feel overmatched. Jesus has never overmatched. God can heal you. God can restore you, and God can redeem what the enemy is stealing from you. So I want to ask you to bow your heads with me right now, would you? I know some of you are really hurt. But God doesn't want you to let divorce to define your identity your destiny. So Father, we want to come to you right now and say, God, help us. As painful as the conversation is, it's a really important one. 
that you would help us, Lord, to trust you, that you can do what we can't do, Father. Well, I want to ask you if you're here today and, and you're one of those people that would say, I'm, I'm broken. Divorce has really impacted me deeply. I want you to put your hand up so I can pray for you today. Just put your hand up high so I can see you. Good for you. Good. Way up in the back. Way to go. Good for you. Good. Father, we want to come to you right now. And a lot of people with hands up, Lord, and we just want to say you are our only hope, Father, that you can give back what the enemy's stolen. So many of us as children have been crushed. Some of us right now, Father, we're in the middle of an affair and we think that we're smart. And the truth is we're destroying ourselves and everything that's important to us. Father, we pray today that you would come, Holy Spirit, with the healing that we need, that you would come, Father, with a touch that we need. We can't get what we need anywhere else but from you. So we ask for your great grace to abound to us, Lord, that you would touch hearts in men's lives in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Would you stand with me real quick? I wanna encourage you before you go out the door, if you need to get into divorce recovery, you may have been divorced for 10 years, but you never dealt with your business. Go to the table on the way out and sign up. We want to help you. We've got shepherd staff here. We've got a great healing ministry here. If you've been broken, allow God to heal you. Amen? Charlie will be out on the concourse. God bless you. Have a great week this week.